Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us for uh, today's session, which is the eighth in a series of mission critical webinars that we've put on here at BPM. My name is Edward Webb, and I'm a partner in the firm's advisory services group. Today's webinar is titled Who's Next? Life Beyond COVID-19, Loan Forgiveness, Emergence, and an Economic Update. Um, so today, our discussion is going to be a little different. Um, we will start with an update on the latest news um, for the economic stimulus. Um, there's been activity just in the last 24 hours. But then we want to introduce uh, some economic consulting models so we can briefly talk about what emergence from the crisis could look like. Um, following on that, um, we're going to um, explore the nuts and bolts of how this can apply to you as business owners and decision makers. Um, because ultimately, uh, the most important aspect of this crisis is going to be how we emerge from it. Um, we have a great panel uh, today um, to speak with you. Um, but first, I want to cover a couple of housekeeping items. Um, the first is you're going to hear a lot of opinions expressed today um, by some pretty knowledgeable people. Um, but I do want to emphasize that these are not necessarily the opinions of, uh, of BPM as a firm. Um, also, you're going to notice um, that there are going to be some interactive polling questions uh, that come up in the course of this session. And so we will ask you to uh, take advantage of this and interact with them. And then we'll be able to give you responses real time. Um, as we go. And so we'll see how we like this. Uh, this is the first time we've had a chance to do this um, with our, our webinars. Um, also, um, with uh, questions that are about the content, uh, you have a Q&A box, um, and we would encourage you to use that um, as early and as often as you have questions. We will try very hard to take them real time um, to the extent that we're not able to do that, um, we will get you answers and we can provide those after. And we can do that along with um, a copy of the slides. Um, and those will probably be sent out tomorrow morning, um, but we'll, we will get those to you. Um, so I think now it uh, probably makes sense um, to let the, uh, the panel introduce themselves. Um, and so, uh, Brett, why don't you start it out, please? Thanks, Edward. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Brett Hazlett. I'm a director uh, in the advisory group. Uh, spent a bunch of time in my career uh, in industry, so in, in most of your shoes. Uh, more recently, uh, doing some economic development work uh, and working with small businesses. Uh, and here at BPM, I've been working uh, with the group uh, on the panel today, really leading our internal efforts on understanding the CARES Act uh, and most specifically the, the loan aspects uh, and, and how to implement those and, and what the impacts are for businesses. So looking forward to updating you guys on that today and uh, answering any questions you may have. Excellent. Thanks, Brett. Um, Sven? Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Sven Yost. I am a partner in BPM's transfer pricing and economic consulting group. I'm an economist by trade. I'm very excited to be part of this panel today talking about a potential economic recovery pass. And I'll keep it very short so I can talk more about that later. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Um, and Terry, please. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Terry Hill. I, I'm a partner in the firm's advisory group. I lead our CFO practice and in that capacity, we spend a great deal of time helping uh, owners and CEOs and principals of businesses tell their story, both internally and to external stakeholders. So we'll talk about that more, but really looking forward to the panel. Thanks, Edward. You bet. So as, as many of you have heard, and, and some of you have been lucky enough to, to have, have squeaked through, uh, and received loans, we, we know we've talked with several of you, but um, unfortunately, uh, at the end of last week, both the Paycheck Protection Program and the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, which are the two primary 
SBA lending programs for the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, ran out of money. So last Thursday, uh, they announced that they had run out of money. Congress was already working on sort of next steps uh, in advance of that, but didn't get them funded in time. However, uh, yesterday, the Senate picked uh, up the legislation and approved it. Uh, looks like the House is uh, slated to do the same tomorrow, which means uh, we'll likely have an approval uh, from the White House by end of day or, or beginning of day Friday. Um, what that means for those programs specifically, uh, for the Paycheck Protection Program, it's $310 billion additional uh, in total, 250 of which is going into the program basically just to backstop what was already uh, put in place. Uh, and then an additional $60 billion has been allocated specifically for banks with smaller capitalizations uh, in an effort to get those funds in the hands of the, the truly small businesses, uh, minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, um, tribal-owned businesses, et cetera. Uh, so there's a little bit, they've sort of gone down two paths there, um, but the 250 will go in immediately and, and with applications still waiting, uh, should begin being processed uh, almost instantaneously. Um, on the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, uh, that also was given additional funding, an additional $50 billion. On that program, the SBA stopped taking applications, uh, so there isn't a queue of applications like there are with the banks on the Paycheck Protection Program. So in this case, when that gets approved by the White House, in theory, uh, the SBA will immediately turn their application program back on so if you're looking for one of those loans, you'll want to be on the lookout for late tomorrow afternoon, possibly Friday morning when the White House passes it and be monitoring how quickly the SBA turns that back on. And then the one other update that we have um, under the original CARES Act, so at the end of last month that was, that was passed, there was a Main Street lending program alluded to um, and again, they've, they've obviously been focused on the smaller businesses, but they're now starting to release some additional information on this. Uh, this program was for any business less than 10,000 employees. So it includes both those between zero and 500, as well as those up to uh, 10,000. Uh, still working on the details. They expect it to be running by the end of April. So Treasury has been issuing guidance and they're working with the banks to sort of finalize that program. What we do know uh, is, is those will be four year loans. Uh, the minimum loan amount is a million dollars. So again, even though it uh, in theory applies to small businesses, for some, uh, the minimum loan size will, will keep them out of qualification. So keep that in mind. Uh, interest rates are um, relatively low, uh, below market rate. So um, that's uh, again a, an attractive feature here, but they're not forgivable uh, like the PPP program. Um, and then amortization is deferred for one year, so principal will continue to accrue, uh, and then amortization will be will happen over the final three years. But the details have not yet been uh, clarified on exactly what that will look like. So Brett, let me fire just a quick question for you. Um, can businesses apply for both PPP and EIDL? Or I guess it's called IDL. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, they can, Edward. That's a great question. Uh, however, there are some restrictions. So the funds uh, that you would get under an EIDL loan would need to be used for uh, purposes different than what the Paycheck Protection Program loan is for. So given that the Paycheck Protection Program is almost entirely payroll, you're really going to be looking at using uh, an EIDL loan for something other than that. So it could be, uh, you know, inventory purchases, it could be, you know, payment of, of uh, accounts payable, um, etc. But it, uh, they need to be at separate purposes. And so 
keeping the accounting square on that would be a really critical part. So you can do it, but you want to be, uh, you know, really clear on what you're using the, the various funds for. Good. Excellent. Um, well, great. I, I appreciate the recap there. Um, and there are a lot of questions that are already coming as to the details of this, and we're going to come back to that. Um, but I want to um, give Sven an opportunity to talk about some of his economic modeling, and we can introduce the idea of emergence here and what this could look like. Sven? Thank you, Edward. Um, what we're doing here is really, as part of this webcast, a little bit of an excursion into uh, economics and macroeconomic environment here in the US. And there's a lot of curves here that you can see on this um, uh, slide. What it is that we've been doing here is a group of economists at BPM that really studied all the data that, that's been out there in terms of projections around economic recovery paths here uh, portrayed as different scenarios, a V, a U, a W, and even an L. Um, what would these different recovery paths, uh, the, the source for the recovery paths are uh, various economists, uh, very clever, a lot smarter than I am, people here in the US uh, by banks, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, uh, many other institutions that really don't do anything else. What we did here is we analyzed this really wealth of information that's out there, different theories, and, and tried to see what do all of those have in common in terms of the economic factors that would be impacting the recovery. And, and what happens if you were to say, this is more likely than something else. What are those factors? Not very surprisingly, right? When is this uh, virus going to peak and how quickly is it contained? Um, economic stimulus packages, how effective are those? Do we maybe even need a new one or other policies, counter-cyclical policies here? Um, what about our foreign economic partners, right? Are they taking control of it? And then how are we easing restrictions and economic fundamentals here, obviously. Um, very quickly, the V curve is the one that's typically portrayed as the most optimistic one where quick down, quick up, very radically quick up uh, in Q2. We have the U where the bottom sort of is dragged out a little bit longer and a recovery still relatively steep would be happening more in Q3. We have the W, which basically assumes that there's a second dip. So you recover out of a, um, a, a contraction, if you will, but then you dip back into because, for example, uh, there may be a second wave and stimulus may not be good enough. And then the L, which really nobody's hoping for, which is steep decline and it takes very long to get back out. And so, this blended curve that, that we put in here, and we'll go into a real-time scenario in just a second, basically says, what if we assign different probabilities to different scenarios? What if we played with the virus peaking and the containment peaking, the virus peaking in June, and maybe containment is later? What if the first stimulus package did not work out? What does that mean for your cash flow and forecasting? And, Terry is going to do a great job uh, after my real-time example here of trying to connect the dots between economic theory and how that may be adjusting your cash flow and what it means. Once you dive into the data, um, and what we just looked at is an example uh, similar to something like this here, where, well, likelihood of a U recovery um, is the likeliest, right? Um, not so much the V, right? The virus may likely not be contained in April, and there is going to be a shortage of cash uh, that we will be observing, at least to some, if, uh, to some effect. And based on this projection here, we would be contracting, uh, and we would still not be in Q1 of 2021, still not be at the same GDP level that we were in Q4 of 2019. Um, let's do maybe one uh, more optimistic example here. 
so you see what it all does uh, if we may still have uh, a little bit more to go where we have recovered fully in Q1 of 2021, right? There may still not be a containment of the virus in, um, in April, but likely more around June or so. Um, there will be some effect from a second stimulus package under these circumstances. And clearly businesses will, would be opening in June and there would be moderate inflows of cash happening in this projected case here in, in Q3. These are national data. Um, we can break these down in industries, but for the purposes of the webcast, I wanted to give you a uh, broad overview of what different uh, recoveries could look like. Certainly macroeconomic factors do play a big role into cash flow and cash flow forecasting. Maybe really quickly, I'll set the stage um, for, the, for the group on the, on the webinar. We've been doing these for, for about 30 days now, and, and obviously very early on, there was a lot of, um, of curiosity and, and some confusion around the CARES Act, around the SBA, and, and how did you apply? Um, what did that process look like? Um, once you've got the funding, what does forgiveness look like, and how do you tell your story about forgiveness? And all of those are natural. And of course, we wanted to start part of today's presentation with an update there, and we'll certainly answer some of the Q&A. But we were compelled pretty quickly to begin to include in these conversations um, what I'll just call a commentary around, well, what's beyond the SBA? And, and I think the basic theme here is that, of course, the SBA is a, is a good thing. The government stepped in, the banks have done their best to make the funding available in an expedient fashion. But all of our businesses have been existentially affected. And so what really does that do? And how do you understand it? And how do you, how do you act upon it? And Sven's done a really nice job of introducing, at least at a high level, that uh, alongside the inputs you have from knowing your business, there are, you know, there's great value in contextualizing some of that with some prognostication of when do we best think this will um, this will all sort of get repaired, and what is the what is that rate of emergence and rate of increase look like? So I want to dive a little bit. This is certainly not going to be a lesson on how to build a cash flow forecast, but I, I did want to cover a few basic things. Um, one of those is, you know. Once we're past the, S, the basic mechanics of the SBA, certainly it's been our encouragement to get right back to what was the strategy before, right? And, and obviously people on this phone that are nonprofit organizations, maybe venture-backed companies, principally held businesses that have been around for decades, all of you are gonna be affected differently and have different needs, but it's important centrally to understand that we, we got to get back to what was the strategy and, and has that been affected, right? Hopefully, some of the information you glean from Sven's work and from some form of a forecast and a cash flow model will inform what you do with your strategy at this point. Um, anecdotally, we've, we've talked to a uh, great many companies, probably almost 100 at this point in the last 30 days as a group, and uh, some are... Uh, you know, they have an increased resolve. We've seen some innovation in spite of the virus where people have done new things in their business and, and, and in, in fact, uh, accelerated prior mandates that just were sitting on the shelf. And, and it's, it's really delightful to see that. Others have, uh, have changed plans, right? It, this, this may be a really existential event and it's, it's important to um, understand what that means and how to guide decision making in the very near term. And we'll talk about that. Um, underpinning all of this is just the fact that every one of us, um, for various reasons, has, a, has had the ability to, before all this, to uh, tell their story, leverage people and systems inside the organization to come up with uh, a forecast, a, a, uh, sometimes it's a board package, some sort of information that guides decision support. And I think that this trigger event, this COVID pandemic, has certainly uh, put a very steep focus on needing to do that and needing to do that probably really, really well and maybe at a level we haven't, haven't really needed to before. Um, and really the goal is to achieve basic visibility at least, 
confidence comes next and then decision support is really what guides you to making some real, real time decisions. So Maggie, let's do next slide, please. And what we're really getting at here is what's going to happen, not now, of course, but in June, July, August, and September. And, and what is it gonna take to weather that storm? What are working capital requirements gonna look like? And um, if, you do, if you do a good enough job of digging a little deeper into the data, um, you may very well find that there are, are things you thought worked well that, that do not, and um, things that you thought weren't profitable or weren't effective in driving the organization that, that are indeed uh, worthy of further investment. Um, so very, very important to uh, get a handle on that. Um, take whatever you have. I think if you haven't built much of a forecast at all, I think starting with a basic version of one will provide you with a great deal of, uh, of high level visibility into what, what may be working and where you, gotta, where you really have to focus your energy. For those that have one, that may be a little bit high level um, it's certainly a good time to get deeper into what may look a lot more like a, a rolling 13 or 26 week forecast. This is a deeper dive. They can become very, very granular, but in its essence, it's a, what does the picture look like three months out? And let's just keep refreshing that on a weekly basis if possible. And that helps you understand, well, what does June, July, August look like? And have I done enough with furloughs with um, maybe some, uh, some terminations and, and leaves and, and or do I need to do more? Um, so it's gonna look different for everybody, um, but I think this is certainly a time that we've got to get much more visible to what, 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 what's, what's working and what isn't and what are the levers in the business that can um, drive cash now and cash in the near future and, and uh, beyond the SBA, what really are your working capital requirements? At the very least, this will fuel internal discussion and internal action. Uh, it certainly is gonna become very important for bank covenants um, and other external constituents. I think we'll, we'll circle back to Brett with regard to the sort of corroborating the forgiveness part of the SBA and all of this is intertwined, right? So I want to interject, if I could, um, before we lose you, Terry, on this. Um, given what you've just said, there are a couple questions that have come along, really, that are regarding best practices for accounting for, uh, to ensure loan forgiveness, but also um, in, in terms of, of emerging and uh, what would you recommend um, regarding those best practices? Well, so, and, and is the question, do we think, Edward, about the actual um, accounting of, of the, the, the income statement or, or, or just properly tracking cash? Well, I think that it, it starts really with loan forgiveness and what yep. we have to do to, you know, what people have to do in order to get that. Um, and then what does that look like going forward? Sure. Well, so at the very least within the loan forgiveness paradigm, you're going to have to track payroll, which is a good thing, right? A deeper dive into your people costs certainly will be a, a, a big component depending on exactly what your business is for a cash forecast and what, we, what your working capital demands will be. Um, the other piece of it is just facilities and utilities. Um, also, if you look at the quick hits, uh, sort of near term good targets for uh, really creating cash with what your prior activities would have, would have, uh, would have uh, drum up. So uh, I, in my second to last bullet, I talk about negotiating, right? You, you have people around, you have landlords, you have vendors, you have customers. I think uh, most of you probably have already begun this naturally, but really truly begin to get um, very focused on negotiating with the people you can, be very careful with long-term important relationships, but landlords are important. Um, you know, common area maintenance for those of you that have it is often an area where there are disputes. It's not necessarily a source of near-term cash, but there are often material amounts of money hidden in the resolution of a, of a CAM account, right? This is the part of a landlord relationship that 
they're not going to voluntarily give you the money back, but there's a, a very easy method for communicating and, and resolving a, an overhang of, of cash coming back to the business. Um, the other two really, really big existential things that I think we've got to focus on is one, however you bill your customers for products and services, do not allow any delay in that, right? Cash conversion cycle is where all of this begins. And then once you've created the AR, you've got to collect on it, right? And that, that goes right back to negotiating, right? Those, those conversations will be different with every client. I think it's good to get way out ahead of that and understand where there may be strain and how you'd manage um, what's going to be probably some diminished collection rate in your business like like everyone. No one here is immune. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Um, Brett, there are, there are a number of questions that are coming in um, regarding uh, eligibility. Um, can you um, review what what is the guidance currently saying um, about nonprofits? Um, has there been anything further to help people um, understand who qualifies and who doesn't? Yeah, so for nonprofits specifically, uh, under the original CARES Act, uh, it was limited uh, primarily to just 501c3 organizations, uh, as well as tribal organizations. Um, in reviewing the language of the bill that passed the Senate, uh, they did not uh, update any of that language. They basically just amended the prior bill to change the dollar amount uh, to increase the authorized funding. So it does not appear that they have made any changes to the requirements uh, as they were originally defined in the law. So if if there's somebody out there that is a nonprofit which is organized differently than a 501c3, would you advise them to make application? Uh, again, I think it's pretty clear that they are not um, allowed. Again, it, it, it doesn't, you know, the, the bank can shut that down quickly. Uh, but the application uh, only allows you to select 501c3. So if you are a C6 or a C7, uh, again, the, the application pretty makes it pretty clear that, that it's not even, you're not even eligible. So I, I think it would be, you know, you would stop with the bank pretty quickly. Uh, so that leaves your options as an EIDL loan, uh, the option to defer uh, payment of payroll taxes, uh, and if you're eligible, the uh, employee retention tax credits. Uh, I think those are the routes I would recommend folks go down, Edward. I, I just think it's pretty clear that they haven't, they haven't changed the guidelines from the original law. And so any C6, C7, or other organizations uh, would not be uh, eligible. Good. Thank you. Um, Brett, and maybe Terry, you'll have an opinion on this one too. Um, are, are there arguments out there regarding uh, how loan forgiveness is recorded? Um, is it to be treated as income um, under PPP? Um, how would it get treated in terms of offset for the costs that it covers? Brett, sure. why don't you start? Yeah, so uh, the obviously when you receive the loan uh, it's recorded as a liability once you apply for forgiveness and the bank confirms the amount uh, that amount plus the accrued interest on the loan uh, would be considered income uh, from a from an accounting books perspective so uh, they haven't defined you know clearly uh, it's, it's most likely going to be an other income type of item uh, rather than a, a revenue item, uh, but it will be other income of some sort. Um, and uh, from a tax books perspective, uh, recall though that this loan is not tax, uh, the income for the forgiveness is not considered taxable income. So on your tax books, it will not show up uh, as income. Okay, Terry, you wanna add something to that? Well, I think the only thing I would add is that I think, and, and, and Brett and I are discussing this a, a few times today, so it's top of mind. I, I, I believe we'll likely get some guidance from 
some of like the AI CPA on best practice for this in the number sort of next 30 days or so as the forgiveness window opens for a decent number of folks. Um, but we, we've been discussing it internally. Our outsourced accounting group is certainly interested. Uh, we've, we've interestingly had a number of, of um, conversations with capital markets folks like private equity investment bankers who are interested in how this might affect uh, the income statement and uh, the balance sheet and quality of earnings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Sven, um, can you talk a little bit more about um, the sensitivity um, in your opinion about the, the economic models um, to uh, the hiccups we may experience um, in terms of um, uh, coming out of shelter in place? I mean, I'm, I know I'm asking you a question that requires a crystal ball, but um, how sensitive is this? Um, you know, how much might we expect I impact of uh, three weeks or a month to be on the economic recovery? So there's certainly a uh, inflection point where you would say a two to maybe three weeks, uh, maybe even four weeks shelter in place may still allow for us to recover under a V, if you will, or a U. I think the inflection point comes if this is more of businesses continue to be closed and not even uh, broadly or at least piece by piece reopened over a prolonged period of time throughout the summer. Uh, remember that the, the U.S. economy was roughly at about 21.7 trillion or so in Q4. A, an astonishing 70% thereof is, is generated by consumers. And so if you have restaurants, bars, small businesses closed for an extensive period of time, and that's where the sensitivity come in, the, the economic stimulus of two trillion, maybe another stimulus of another two trillion in Q2 is really not going to do that much good relative to, let's say the consumer spending pulling back by 30, 40 percent. It's, it's not going to make up for it. So long story short, there is clearly an inflection point. You'll see uh, individual states slowly opening right now. And it's a fine balance between the reopening of the economy and obviously the health. Um, but the longer you wait, the more damaging, uh, the, re the more damaging the dent to the econ economy and the even longer um, the way out. That's the L, the bad L. Okay, thank you. Um, Terry, that is a, that's a pretty uh, cautionary um, observation. Um, what, what does, how does that translate? Um, you know, as you're looking at this and, and you're thinking about your clients, um, what, what does that mean? What, what kind of counsel do you provide? Yeah, I think that this is where having a more granular view of how leading indicators in your business are being affected in a 13 week, as an example, cash flow forecast, you're going to know when uh, billings are diminished. And of course, collections will be soon to follow. And if you compound a, a diminishment, diminishing of billings, and then a sort of pushing out of collections, obviously, you've got a a significant working capital pinch. So it's really important to understand how all of these will interplay and at what point you, you need to potentially have a different strategy. This is, this is where decision supports guided by the underlying data in a cash flow forecast. There's certainly a whole world of, um, of alternative financing and investment available to the right kinds of candidates and certainly companies that can tell the story and who in any way possible have proved some sort of counter cyclicality and or innovation in the face of the COVID paradigm will have a likely positive outcome to those conversations. But uh, it, it really does require that you have a sense of what this means 
all of these sort of tranches of capital have a different cost of capital and, and, and an impact on the company. You just have to start with understanding the, uh, the sort of uh, cash flows from operations point of your business. And that really does start with some modicum of a forecast. If you have one already, I think you need to dial it up one or two notches so you have more visibility into what's going to happen in the summer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Brett, we've got, we've got some detailed questions here that are, uh, that are backing up. Um, and so we need to, uh, we need to get after it. Um, question comes, what is the best way to receive 100% forgiveness of the PPP loan? If I've already laid off employees and I can't take them back because of county mandates and people can't go to work, how do I handle that? What, what might be a reasonable response? Sure. Um, yeah, the most, the most uh, or, or I guess the best answer that, that we can give is that you are obviously allowed to, to pay employees whether they are working or not. So under this program, the government's intention is that even if your employees are not able to be physically at work, uh, you could pay them, uh, which obviously keeps them, you know, off of unemployment and other government programs. So that's really the only way uh, under the, the way they've defined the law now, because the eight weeks gets triggered on your funding date. So really the only way to attempt to get full forgiveness is to bring back uh, your workforce for that time period, um, pay them as they would have been paid uh, during your 2019 uh, qualification period and then obviously communicate with them that they need to let you know their their state and local unemployment offices know that that they've gone off of unemployment for that time period if uh, any of them have gone on. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the reasons why that's such an important question is that we're, we're talking about economic recovery now um, and what are the steps that we may be able to take to ensure it. But ultimately, this is a, this is a people issue. Um, and, and what's happened has impacted um, individuals dramatically. And PPP is a plan which is really designed to put money in people's pockets so that they can pay their own rent and put food on their tables. Um, and so, with that in mind, it, it's a bridge to get businesses to a place where they can open back up. Um, and so, absolutely, this, this thing has been designed so you can pay people who aren't showing up. Um, so, if somebody has spent all of their loan proceeds um, by the end of June uh, on eligible items. Um, what happens, um, do, do they have, if their payroll is um, paying out at the same amount, um, what, what might come next for them? Would you anticipate there will be, um, uh, you know, a next round? Will there be subsequent tranches to this? How do we, how do we deal with this? Yeah, it does appear, uh, you know, by, by their own definition of, of how they've described uh, the bill that was passed yesterday by the Senate as an interim measure. Uh, so it does appear that, you know, Congress is at least gearing up for the possibility that additional funding will be required. Uh, what that looks like, again, is, is anyone's guess. It's likely to include, uh, you know, if they go that path, it's likely to include, you know, paychecks directly to people again, as the original CARES Act did and things like that. Uh, what it means specifically for businesses, uh, you know, I think would only be speculation at this point. Okay. Um, regarding um, EIDL and PPP. Um, if, if you have exhausted your PPP funds for payroll, can EIDL funds be used? Yeah, it's a great question. I think the law is unfortunately not clear, and it's probably one of those things that 
we'll get some guidance on, um, you know, conceptually, you, you could certainly make an argument that you're using the PPP funds uh, for the eight week period and the EIDL after that. Um, however, as the, as the law has defined it currently, it says that it needs to be used for different, uh, you know, expense types, basically. So that would sort of send, lead, you, lead you down the path of, of it's not uh, going to qualify even if it's outside the window. So I think, you know, I think it's something that will likely be clarified. Um, and, and so you, you just need to be careful about, about how you think about that up until that point. Yeah, and this is, this is likely a little fuzzy for everyone. This is ultimately a, a sort of summarization page um, of, of, again, what can be a simple or fairly granular 13-week cash flow. So you've got the, in, in the columns, sort of the, the right three-fourths of the page are weeks one through 13, which is obviously a three-month period. And, and you have some of the basic uh, accounts here tracked ultimately what ends up happening as you and again it was some of Sven's inspiration you can probably take what you know about your business already and inform some of these inputs with with more economic information um, but as you get billings and collections that get pushed out obviously if you were to chart this on a graph you begin to see uh, really clearly in a waterfall or some other some other visualization that you know, that your cash position begins to get compressed and so um, you know, having, having something like this that illustrates um, what's going to happen in July, August allows you to course correct today, right? You know, you can't, you can't conserve your cash in August um, to affect August. Uh, it's too late, right? So we've got to get ahead of it. Um, I'm also trying to read this, Edward. I'm looking at my version. The, um, the other things that that uh, that show up here, uh, obviously, are AR, and then um, you know, it, depending on how how deep you want to go into product segments, divisions, or departments, uh, you'll begin to highlight where uh, energy and focus is required, or where things might need to be uh, reconsidered. Right. So, um, getting ahead of a underperforming department, product line, or service. Um, will very likely have limited resources directed towards um, towards the things that are going to affect collect billings and collections um, to your customers and will affect the kind of months two, three, four of cash and your working capital position. Um, and again, we've, we've, we've laid people off, we've furloughed people. So um, staying very focused on the three or four key items that are going to drive the levers in this cash flow forecast are going to be critical. And this is where the cash flow forecast inputs and the decision support really drive cross-functional activity. You've got leadership that then says, let's go to, go and talk to the sales team, delivery team, development team, um, whoever they may be to get focused on hopefully a very finite number of two, three key mandates that are going to drive working capital over the next couple of months. What qualifies as expenses? Um, you know, beyond uh, utilities like PG&E, um, might it also include uh, cloud-based subscriptions, for example? Um, what kind of insight do you have on that? Sure, great question. So uh, let's hit all of the expenses just quickly. So. Payroll costs are, of course, included using the same definition that you use for your loan forgiveness amount calculation. So that includes health benefits, retirement benefits, state and local taxes, uh, and it, of course, includes the cap on uh, highly paid employees, those over $100,000. Uh, it also includes mortgage interest, so not full mortgage payments, but the interest portion of your mortgage payments any rent payments, which at this point we believe include both real estate as well as any equipment loans. Uh, and then finally on utilities, uh, they've actually given us a fair amount of specificity there. So it includes electric, gas, water, telephone, and internet access. Okay, good, um, thank you. Um, 
Gentlemen, we have um, two minutes each um, for a uh, little summary. Um, and I might ask you, um, is, there, is there something that we've missed here? Um, is there something that people need to be thinking about um, that maybe hasn't come up? Um, and so let me start with you, Terry. I think we've hit the high points, Edward. Um, I think a couple of things. One, use the SBA, consume that money, tell your story so you can get forgiven, make that a grant. Um, and then let's just get right back to um, everyone's very, very different strategy before all this. And, and what do you do um, in the face of diminished uh, capacity, diminished revenue in some cases, diminished collectability? And how do you steer the business towards uh, emergence? Um, I think in some cases, this is going to be existential. Some people may have to consider protecting themselves individually. So be prepared to do that. Um, and, and again, a cash flow forecast certainly will highlight in the coming months where, where there are going to be areas of pinch and where you might be able to get performance out of, out of components of the business you hadn't thought of. But ultimately, plan ahead, be ready to tell your story, at least for the, the PPP forgiveness, but also for the bank, for people that might uh, be interested in, in helping you um, go forward, um, and for the, uh, the internal stakeholders in the business, right? I think that's it. Excellent. Sven? I'm generally an optimist, and I would say uh, use the data that is out there in a fashion that helps you make great business decisions and strategies. And one of the ways to do this is um, using this information that is out there, the data, uh, the theories, right? And combine this with something that Terry does uh, to really boost the assumptions behind these models. There is a lot out there and, there, and industries are all different. And so the macroeconomic environment that matters uh, tremendously as, as one of the external, not necessarily business related, but external resources. Thank you, Brett. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, getting um, good documentation in place as we think about loan forgiveness is really critical. Like Terry said, uh, you know, planning out what that looks like, et cetera. So there's that piece, you know, really being able to evidence both what was the expense, how much was it, and then being able to show that you actually paid that same amount is going to be critical. Uh, more importantly, uh, I would say is, um, you know, thinking about um, how to uh, plan going forward, knowing that, that that's going to be there, but also how to be flexible in the short term because we don't know all the rules yet. So don't get yourself, you know, too far out ahead until you're really clear on this. So stay really close to the guidance from the SBA. We expect that to come down in the next week or two. Uh, again, there's a lot of detailed questions that we didn't get to, and I think there will be more information coming out on those. Uh, so feel free to reach out to us, use us as a resource. Uh, the SBA and Treasury have done a good job of keeping Q and A's up to date on their website as well. And so, you know, Bringing back folks uh, is going to, you know, make sense, but make sure that we're going to understand how that works with, with loan forgiveness over the next week or two uh, will be really critical. So both long-term thinking as well as short-term being flexible uh, to what guidance the SBA issues will be really important. Thank you. And uh, guys, I'm going to leave you with three things. Um, one, document, document, document keep your books and records. When you are receiving money like PPP, um, you are gonna wanna be able to account for it very carefully and demonstrate to bankers and to the government um, and maybe even to auditors somewhere down the road how you use those funds. So document, document, document. The second thing I'm gonna offer up is um, build a war chest. Um, it always feels better to have some cash. So sock it away, hold on to it. Any moves that you may need to make in the future that are of a structural nature, 
um, or require some significant change in the business is likely to cost cash. And so you want to squirrel some cash away when you can. And then the last thing I'm going to say is um, rely on your friends. Um, I have been um, absolutely stunned by um, what I have noticed as the, the outpouring of, of willingness of people to provide advice and to pitch a shoulder to the wheel, to help people with applications, to provide a second set of eyes, um, to make a referral. Um, you have a network of people out there and use them. And when people call you for advice, give it to them. Um, because I really do believe it is our networks of contacts that is the most valuable thing we have. Um, and so um, take good advantage of that. Thank you for joining this afternoon, joining us this afternoon. Um, it really has been a pleasure. Um, you guys uh, stay safe out there. Thank you.